Hello, my name is Dr. Teresa Bacon Bagley. I'm a professor at Grand Valley State University in the College of Health Professions. Today we're going to discuss the blast mechanisms that cause a traumatic brain injury. By the end of this module, you should be able to describe the mechanism of a blast injury and be able to describe the four potential types of injury sustained during exposure to a blast force. Now we're going to spend a few minutes going over the characteristic of blast waves, waves that are generated due to an explosive device being detonated. There are several factors which play a role in the injury due to an explosion. The explosion causes an increase in air pressure followed by a negative pressure or a suction type force. The blast waves also travel faster than sound making it difficult to prepare for. This diagram depicts the change in pressure after a blast force or after an explosion. On the right hand side of the figure you see a line here that represents time and then you see the pressure as it increases at time of detonation causing the house and the tree in this picture to actually be pushed away from the explosion. After a very short period of time, the pressure decreases and actually becomes negative. That negative pressure is a sucking pressure to draw the object, in this case the house and the tree, toward the area where the explosive device went off. So initially we have a positive pressure pushing the object away from the site of detonation. That's followed by the negative or sucking pressure that pulls the object toward the area of detonation. An explosion creates a very powerful pulse of hot compressed gas that radiates outward generating that wave of pressure that can travel up to 1,500 miles per hour. The bigger the bomb, the faster and more forceful the wave. A vacuum of air trails the initial wave creating that violent sucking force or suction force that can shear internal organs. This is a diagram showing time after detonation and then pressure. After the explosive device goes off, there's this increase in pressure that's pushing things away from the area of detonation. The pressure decreases followed by a negative pressure that creates that sucking or pulling force toward the area of detonation. The shock waves that are generated in the explosion can rattle the brain within the skull and can also compress the torso or body which can transfer energy into the blood vessels. That energy is transferred to the blood which goes into the brain. One theory for the explanation of head injury after a blast is that the oscillating waves travel through that bloodstream and into the brain where they twist and injure neurons over time. This picture depicts a normal neuron and an injured neuron. There are some characteristics that actually can influence the blast wave. One of the ways by which the blast can be affected is by the type of explosive. There are two major types. There are high energy explosives and there are low energy explosives. High order explosives are chemicals converted into a gas at very high temperature and pressure. In these explosives, the blast wave expands outward in all directions. Examples of high-order explosives are nitroglycerin, dynamite, C4, ammonium nitrate, as well as fuel oil.
Low order explosives are designed to burn and gradually release energy at a relatively slow rate. They do not create waves that are generated by high order explosives and the injuries are caused by fragments of the container, blast wind, as well as thermal injuries. Examples of low order explosives are pipe bombs and gunpowder. The injury can also be dependent on the distance from detonation. As this picture depicts, the closer to the explosion, the more severe the forces. Extremely close to the explosion can result in death, whereas the further you get away, the less injuries that are sustained. However, there could be hidden injuries with long-term consequences, even though you're far away from the explosion site. Another thing that can affect the force of the explosion is whether the individual is in an open versus a closed space. Explosions near or within hard solid surfaces are amplified two to nine times because of shock wave reflection. The waves actually can hit a brick wall and then reflect back toward the area of detonation. Victims that are positioned between the blast and a building often suffer two to three times the degree of injury of a person in an open space. This vignette here, Mythbusters example of shock waves in a closed space, depicts exactly how that wave reflects off a solid surface. Now there are four types of injury that can be sustained from an explosion. The primary injury is the injury caused by the blast wave itself. The secondary injury is injury caused by fragments of debris propelled by the explosion. That can be shrapnel, it can be rocks, it can be a variety of items that are within the vicinity of detonation. Tertiary injury is injury due to acceleration of the body or part of the body by the blast wind. An example of a tertiary injury would be an injury sustained when the body actually is lifted and thrown into a brick wall. Quaternary injury is injury due to burns or post-detonation environmental contaminants. Burns are extremely common after being exposed to explosion based on the extreme heat that's generated during the event. It is possible to have a combination of the four types of injury. For example, an individual may have a primary injury along with second or third degree burns, which are defined as the quaternary injury. This is the end of the module on traumatic brain injury and the blast mechanisms causing that injury.